Hello brothers this is Christ. I wanted to start this video with a hymn called I Love to Tell the Story. So if you want to pause the video and look up the hymn, I Love to Tell the Story. I want to try. <laughs> it's kind of voice kind of rough this morning. I love to tell the story of unseen things above of Jesus and his glory of Jesus and his love I love to tell the story because I know tis true it satisfies my longings as nothing else can do I love to tell the story Will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best, same hungering and thirsting. To hear it like the rest And when in scenes of glory I sing a new, new song Twill be the old, old story That I have loved so long I love to tell the story Will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. To tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Brothers, this is Christ. Today we're going to be talking about how many baptisms are there and which one is, is, which one is for today. Which one's for us? Which one do we have to have in order to be saved and born again? And that's the reason I saw that song, I sung that song, because we're going to get into the gospel again. The real gospel is for today. Okay? The gospel that gets perverted so much in the lost world because they don't want the salvation that's for today. The saving grace that God gives. They don't want to do what God tells them they have to do to get that saving grace. To get that free gift. So, I've said in a lot of videos before where I talk about how I don't believe water baptism is for today. And I've been telling you and promising you guys that we do a solid study on it. Well, here we are. We're going to do a solid study on it. And the best way the Lord put on my heart to do it is saying, well... Let's start out with how many baptisms are there? They'll try to make it out like there's only one baptism. No, there isn't. Okay. And we're going to get to that verse that says one baptism. But it's talking about for today there's only one baptism. But how many baptisms are actually mentioned in the Bible? So, turn to Matthew 3.11. I got my huge Bible here. So, so there's going to be times where we're going to be turning it. I'm going to be turning with you. But right now, remember, you can pause the video and you can turn to the, ch the verses as we go through them. Try to keep this study from being so, <coughs> so long. Sometimes if it feels like I'm rushing, I, I apologize. I just, I just don't, I, I love Bible studies, brother, sister, Christ. And we get into Bible studies, we get into Scripture, we get into comparing Scripture with Scripture, Scripture. Next thing I know, it's two to three hours long. It's like, I understand that's kind of long for some of the brethren. And I'm trying to keep them short, but I still love the scriptures, and I'm still going to try to get the truth out, no matter how long it takes. So I'm doing everything I can, brothers and Christ, to kind of shorten the, the time of the video. I kind of have a little bit of a dry throat today, so forgive me. So Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. This is a great verse, and also Luke 3, 16. But these are two great parallel verses showing how many baptisms there are. All right. So Matthew 3.11 says, I indeed, this is John the Baptist, the only real Baptist is John the Baptist. We'll get into that a little bit later. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. There's one baptism, water baptism. 
But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Three baptisms. Verse 12 says, Whose fan is in the, his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into his garners. Those that were baptized with the Holy Spirit are the wheat that he gathers into his garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquestionable fire, the lost world. There is the baptism with fire. I was talking with a brother in Christ, and we were talking, it's like, if you get baptized with fire, you're toast. There's no coming back from that. You're going to hell in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. That's the baptism of fire. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But again, the Bible defines itself. Let us know what those two baptisms are. The one with the Holy Ghost, the one with fire. But you see there, there's three baptism, baptisms mentioned there. Water, Jesus baptizing with the Holy Ghost. Mankind, if you look at John the Baptist, John is a man down here. So men down here baptizing with water. Then you have Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. And then you have Jesus baptizing with fire. There's three baptisms. Luke 3.16, the parallel verse. If you want to you know, pause the video, turn to Luke 3.16. John answered, said unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water. There's the first type of baptism. And it's mankind down here doing it. But one mightier than I cometh, the latch of his shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire three baptisms, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor with fire, and will gather the wheat into his garner, the Holy Ghost, but the chaff he will burn with fire and questionable. Baptism with fire again. Right. But there's three baptisms mentioned there. So let's get into this. The best way to explain this is to define the three different types of baptism. So let's start with the baptism of water under repentance. Remember what John the Baptist said. And like I said, I keep saying this over and over. He's the only true Baptist. Two points I want to make here. Jesus never baptized with water. So you can't say, well, look, when Jesus baptizes with the Holy Ghost, it's with water too. You know, it's the same thing. No, you read, Jesus never baptized with water. His disciples did. His apostles did. But he himself baptized nobody with water. Because water baptism isn't for today. Getting ahead of myself. So that's one thing I want to point out. Okay, And then you have John. He's the one baptizing. You have men down here that are baptizing with water. Baptism of water. Turn back. To, uh, we're going to stay in Matthew chapter 3. Go back to Matthew chapter 3. Because we were just in Luke 3. Matthew chapter 3. We're going to go through the whole thing. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1. All the way through 10. Okay. In those days came John the Baptist. Now stop. He was called John the Baptist. Why? Because water baptism, the kingdom of heaven gospel, was first revealed to John. That term, Baptist, is reserved for John and John alone. His apostles were, not apostles, he didn't have apostles. His disciples, you know, he had the disciples of John, then he had the disciples of Jesus. John's disciples were never called Baptists. Jesus was never called a Baptist. His disciples were never called Baptists. His apostles were never called Baptists. The only reason John was called a Baptist is because water baptism was first introduced through John. The kingdom of heaven gospel, which we're going to read in here. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand? We'll get to the actual location of the verse where it says, The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. He's talking about the physical kingdom. Israel's going to be a nation again, a kingdom, and we're going to have a king. That's what he's preaching. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. That's what the water baptism is. Repent. And be water baptized. Your Lord is coming. Your King is coming. The Messiah. The Christ. The King. You got to get yourself cleaned up. The King is coming. You got to get your sins washed away. You have to wash your sins away. That's what water bath. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but that's what water baptism is. You are washing your sins away. Didn't we read that in Revelation? Were they washing their own robes? 
Jesus Christ washed me in his own blood. God the Father washed me in Jesus Christ, the blood of his Son. My robes are washed white by Jesus Christ. In the time of Jacob's trouble in Revelation, they have to wash their own robes. What is that? We're seeing it here when Jesus was first coming, when John's coming. They have to wash themselves clean. That's what water baptism is. And we're going to prove it. All right. Prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John, John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girl about his loins, and his meat was lust and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan. John's baptizing. That's why you had disciples of John. Okay. And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. They were repenting, and then they were water baptizing, confessing their sins, saying, we're putting away our sins, we're cleaning ourselves. The water baptism is washing our sins away, it's an outward showing, Jews require a sign, Greeks seek after wisdom. They're washing their own sins away, and they're putting their sins to the side. So repentance happens in the heart, and then they get water baptized, confessing their sins, and they turn from those sins because they're trying to get clean because their king is coming. And we're baptized of him in Jordan, preparing the way of the Lord. They're getting ready for the Lord to show up. And we're baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come into his baptism, all. Oh, Everyone's doing this. It's just a traditions of man. It's just something that we do just because it's tradition. Their heart wasn't right. And John saw right through them. And once again, I'm getting ahead of myself, but water baptism today is just an escape of not actually following the Bible. The true sh outward showing is the changed life. You turn from your sins after salvation as evidence of salvation. Remember we talked about what it means to be in Christ? It's made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification. When you realize you're not doing things God's way, you turn from the world's way and you start doing things God's way. After salvation, what's water baptism? It's just some, so you can put on a show and pretend. That's what these Pharisees, oh, everyone's doing it, it's popular, okay, we're going to go do it. But their heart wasn't right. Jesus said himself, they do honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why do you think God got mad at all the Jews in the Old Testament there towards the end when it comes, he says he doesn't like the sacrifices. They're starting to, the, 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 the incense and the sacrifices, they're starting to stink. Why? Because they think that they can just get away with living however they want to live, doing whatever they want to do, loving their sin, and they just come and, and do whatever's popular and continue in their sin, and continue doing what got them in trouble to begin with. What got me in trouble with the Lord? My sin. Now that I'm saved, why do I want to continue in that? Sorry, I'm kind of jumping down a little bit. You have these Pharisees that are coming saying, hey, this is popular. The people love it. Hey, I'll do it. Sound familiar like today? Oh, you, water baptism is required for salvation. We're going to prove that it isn't. Oh, we should just do water baptism after salvation. It's just something you do as an outward showing. No, it isn't, and we're going to prove that too. Water baptism, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it has no place in the gospel today, in the time of the Gentiles. And we're going to prove that through the scriptures. But right here, just to get the context, you have these Pharisees coming in, their heart's not right with the Lord. They think they can do a little water baptism, and they're good to go. Just dunk dust on the water, and we're good to go. Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism. He said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. Oh, I repented. Prove it. Oh, I have faith. Prove it. Oh, I'm one of you. Prove it. There's supposed to be proof, and today they try to steal that proof from us and say, we're not supposed to be asking for proof. Here's John the Baptist yelling at these Pharisees saying, bring forth therefore fruit, meat for repentance. Are you truly coming in repentance so I can baptize you? Repentance in the heart, having sorrow for turning against God? Remember what the Pharisees were yelled at? They held the traditions of men above the commandments of God? 
They were lovers of money, power, and control. They were, they, uh, what do you call, um, there's a word where they lord over the laity. Um, maybe the Lord will bring it to me. <laughs> but they had problems. They weren't doing things God's way. Their heart wasn't for the Lord. If they were truly repenting, there's going to be a change. There's going to be fruits meet for repentance. That's what Paul's saying. Prove it. Prove that your heart's in the right place. Prove that you're not just coming down here to put on a show before everybody else because this is popular. We always have done it. A little bit don't hurt. We know when to quit. You remember all those excuses? One of them was, is we always have done it. The Bible, Paul warns us today not to be spoiled by the traditions of men, by the root, I'm sorry, spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. It's always a heart issue, and I've said this a million times. I'm sorry, to go, I don't mean to go off on it too much, but it's always a heart issue, not a head issue. It's not what you know, it's what you believe. It's the faith and the fruit that meets for repentance. If you truly believe, your life's going to show it. If, you're, if you truly believe God's way is the right way, your life is going to show it. If you truly believe and have sorrow in your heart for sinning against God, after God saves you, your life's going to show it. There's evidence. Paul says, prove your own selves. Examine whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Then he tells me, you know what? Just prove yourself in all things. Make sure you're proving yourself. You're not all talk. Like these guys were. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to the, of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Remember how many times Jesus got into it with them? They're like, Abraham's our father. We're disciples of Moses. Abraham's our father. Their heart's still not in the right place. They're still enemies of God. Not servants of God. Verse 10. And know also that the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And then he goes back into what we just read. I indeed baptized with water. But he that cometh after me, Holy Ghost and fire, three baptisms. The baptism of water into repentance. Okay. Matthew 3 2 says, Hey, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is hand. Water baptism is linked to the kingdom of heaven gospel, sometimes kingdom of God gospel, when it comes to the physical kingdom. Now, I know some people are going to jump up and down and say, No, kingdom of God is always a reference to uh, the spiritual kingdom. I want to prove that's not true. There are two parts to the kingdom of God, the temporal and the eternal, the physical and the spiritual. There's two parts. You have to follow 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing to see when the kingdom of God is a reference to the spiritual kingdom and when kingdom of God is a reference to the physical kingdom. I'll show it here. All right. Notice it says, Matthew 3, two says, in saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We read that. Now, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, John gets thrown into prison. What happens? Jesus takes over. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's saying it, the kingdom of heaven. Remember, kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take by force. It's talking about the physical king, or physical king and physical kingdom coming in. You're to repent and be water baptized, for your king is coming. Matthew 4.23 says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Starting to get a little hot. Gospel of the kingdom. Okay? And healing every sick and every diseased among people. The gospel of the kingdom. There's more than one gospel. But what gospel is for today? Some people are preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven and they're trying to mix it in with the gospel that's for today, and they're trying to make it one gospel, and all you're doing is making a huge mess. You're creating false converts. People are not finding the way of salvation. Now, don't get me wrong. If you truly are seeking the truth, God will bring you the truth. But this gospel of the kingdom is repent, be water baptized for the remission of sins, and prepare for your king coming. You had to believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Remember when he asked Peter, 
all the apostles, what do they say I am? Then he asks them, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Christ, the Messiah, the Christ, the King. You're our King. And not just any King, you're God manifest in the flesh. The son, capital S, Son of God. You're God, and you are our King. That's this gospel of the kingdom that was being preached in Matthew, and Mark, and Luke, and even in John. I got onto it with some people because I said, why are you going to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for the gospel? You won't find the entire gospel in its entirety in any of these books. But what they'll do is they'll read something and just try to say, see, that's, that, that, that lines up with today. I got into it, especially like John 3.16. I said, where does it say how he died for our sins? In John 3.16 and further, how he died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Where's that at in John 3.16? Watch out. You can get mad at me all you want. Watch out. We're going to prove that if you want the true plan of salvation and you want to truly get saved today, you go to Paul. The gospel that's for today was revealed to Paul not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Paul. We're going to get into this. I'm getting ahead of myself again. But this gospel of the kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of God. That physical kingdom. Once again, we'll say it again. You have to repent. You have to be water baptized for the remission of sins. We're going to get into those verses. Remission of sins. And you had to believe that Jesus is the Lord. They're preparing the way of the Lord. Their king. Their Christ. Their Messiah. Matthew 24, 14 says, now this is Matthew 24. This is the Sermon on the Mount. So you see that the king, that gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven gospel was being preached when Jesus was physically here. It was preached, we're going to read this in the early book of Acts. Then there's a transition and we get to the gospel that's revealed to Paul and that's the gospel that's for today. But this kingdom of heaven gospel is going to come back in the time of Jacob's trouble. Matthew 24 is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, 24 and 25. And it says here, because you get to 24 and 25, it says kingdom of heaven. It's talking about that physical kingdom. Jesus coming back and ruling and reigning. Matthew 24, 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom, talking about the kingdom of heaven, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. It's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. So this gospel of the kingdom of heaven, where water baptism is used, I believe it's going to come back in the time of Jacob's trouble. The water baptism will come back, but it's going to come back in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? That's not for today. Mark 1.14. Mark 1.14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Wait a minute. No, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven in Matthew. Now in Mark, he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. They're one and the same. That's why you got to be careful of preachers out there who think the kingdom of God is always 100% the spiritual kingdom. That is not true. They are in error. They're either intentionally lying to you, or they've been lied to, and they're promoting that lie. It's the same gospel that's being preached. One says kingdom of heaven, the other one says kingdom of God. We know that kingdom of heaven is always a reference to the physical kingdom. Then you see over here it says kingdom of God. They're the same gospel. So here, kingdom of God, when you rightly divide, it's still talking about the physical kingdom. How do we know? Keep going. And saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Where do we read that up there in Matthew 3, 2? And saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? The physical kingdom? Then down here in a parallel passage, same story in Mark. It says kingdom of God. Do you realize the only place that mentions kingdom of heaven is the book of Matthew? It, that, that term is not in Mark. That title, that description is not in Mark. It's Matthew, Mark. It's not in Mark. It's not in Luke. And it's not in John. It's only in the book of Matthew. And every parallel story that you read in Mark, Luke, and John that lines up with Matthew, that's how you can tell they're still talking about the physical kingdom. Because in all the other books it says kingdom of God, not kingdom of heaven. But they're telling the same story. 
the same event. Okay, they're preaching about the physical kingdom. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now it says, for here we see kingdom of God is at hand, whereas in Matthew 3, 2, it's with the kingdom of heaven. They're one and the same. They're both still talking about the physical kingdom. I'll say it again. The kingdom of heaven, I'm sorry, kingdom of God has two parts. The, the physical and the spiritual. The temporal, which is physical, and eternal, which is spiritual. There's two parts to the kingdom of God. Which one is it talking about? Well, you have to rightly divide. You've got to compare Scripture with Scripture. Or you can be lazy and just say, uniform translation, well, kingdom of God, because the one verse talks about how the kingdom of God uh, is, me, is it's peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, where it's, it's not meat and drink. You know, it's not the physical, it's the spiritual. So therefore, every time it has to be the spiritual. That's a lazy person who doesn't want to do the work, who doesn't want to rightly divide. Matthew eleven twelve, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. You can only take that physical kingdom by force. And we've seen, even in the last 2,000 years, Jerusalem, that holy city, God's city, where the great king's going to be ruling and reigning. It's been fought over left and right for the last 2,000 years. It was fought over even before when this was being written. In Jesus' day, it's been fought over. At the time, Romans had control. Right? It's the physical kingdom. You always compare Scripture with Scripture. Now, the baptism that's for the kingdom of heaven is water baptizing, and you're washing yourself. Period. Now, the baptism that you see in the early book of Acts, first I want to go back to Mark 1.4, where it says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. We're going to look up the word remission, because some people don't seem to realize that. You had to be water baptized in repentance. Your heart had to be right. And then get water baptized for the remission of sins. Okay. Well, well, we'll go through it real quick. Remissions. I looked it up in the 1828 dictionary. Then you do a Bible study. You can do a word study on it and see if it lines up with the Bible. But remission means forgiveness, pardon. That is the giving up of the punishment due to a crime as the remission of sins. In other words, to get God forgiveness, you had to be water baptized when it comes to the kingdom of heaven gospel, when Jesus was physically there. In the early book of Acts, we're going to be reading it in the time of Jacob's trouble. You have to wash your own robes. Okay. That washing is what cleans your sins away and takes your sins away. So in Mark 1, 4, John the Baptist, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then you get to Acts 2, 38, and here's Peter. Remember Peter and Paul, when Jesus was physically there, they were preaching that kingdom of heaven. Repent and be baptized, water baptized, for the remission of sins. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Talking about water baptism, because they were still water baptizing. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, whose fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. It goes back to what John said. So they're saying, we're going to baptize in Jesus' name, but they weren't quite getting it. Water baptism is you washing your sins away. And Paul even proves this. We're going to get into it with Paul. So you see in the early book of Acts, they were still preaching the kingdom of heaven gospel if there's water baptism involved. It's not the gospel it's for today. By the time you get to the end of Acts, Acts 20, 21, this is Paul, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. What happened to be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins? What happened to that? The kingdom of heaven gospel got put off. I always say like a pause button. Okay, we're going to hit a pause button. Why? Because we're going to bring in the time of the Gentiles. This is where salvation goes out to the world. Anybody can get saved. The kingdom of heaven gospel is just for the Jews, for salvation is of the Jews. When Jesus sent out his, 
his 12 apostles, he sent them out two by two, before two or three witnesses, let every word be established, and he told them not to go in the way of the Gentiles, nor of the Samaritans, Jews that have lost the inheritance, but only to the house of Israel, those that still had the inheritance, that had the right to be called Jews. Why? For salvation is of the Jews. The kingdom of heaven gospel is for the Jews. And people will get on to me all through the book of Acts. I've proven that, you know, that Pentecost, they were all Jews. When you get to Philip uh, baptizing that eunuch with water, that eunuch was a Jew. One of the biggest things they always push, and we've talked about it in studies before, is how that's a Gentile. That's, I've proven that it's a Jew. He's coming back from Jerusalem, from worshiping in the temple, because that's how you worship at Jerusalem. You do it in the temple. Paul went to do it, and they tried to arrest him. Why? Because they thought he took Trophimus, a Gentile. Gentiles are not allowed to worship at Jerusalem. They're not allowed. But here you have this eunuch that's a slave, a Jewish slave in another land, but you go back to Pentecost, all these Jews from all these other lands... Because they got spread out by Nebuchadnezzar way back when. They're from other lands. They have other languages from their land, but they're Jews. But they were born there. They had to learn the local language, and they had to learn Hebrew. They had to learn two languages. And they're all sitting there. They're speaking in our language. They're talking about where they come from. But they're Jews. We can prove that. This guy was coming from, from Jerusalem for after worshiping at the temple. And where do you worship in Jerusalem? At the temple. So he was in the temple worshiping, which Gentiles aren't allowed. He's reading Jew, a, a Jewish parchment of Isaiah. I think it was Isaiah where he's talking about Jesus Christ. And Philip runs up to teach him about Jesus Christ, and he gets water baptized. Where's the repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ? That wasn't preached to him. He was preached the repentance of water baptism, and believing that Jesus is the King, He's the Christ, He's the Messiah, He's the King. But by the time you get to the end of Acts, it changes. It's no longer the same gospel. We're not under the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, the gospel of the kingdom of God, the Old Testament, the physical kingdom that's being preached to the Jewish people. We are now under the gospel that was revealed to Paul to the Gentiles. There's a change in the gospel from repent and be baptized for the remission of sins that water baptism washes your sins away and links you to the physical kingdom and you're of the person that baptized you. Something I've left out. You're of the person that baptized you. You have John the Baptist. I'm disciples of John. Then you had Jesus had his disciples and his disciples were water baptizing and his disciples were of Jesus. Now Jesus never baptized with water. But they were still doing it as a whole. You're of whoever baptized you. That's why I don't call myself a Baptist today, because John didn't buy it, baptize me. I'm pointing here, John. John didn't baptize me. I'm pointing to my computer because I have some things up on the computer in case we need it. Um, John didn't baptize me. I was baptized by Jesus Christ. I'm of Christ. I'm in Christ. Okay? I'm part of the body of Christ. The water baptism washes your sins away and, links, and it's linked to the physical kingdom. Another thing I left out when we read a lot of those things is when you see Jesus doing all the miracles and everything, that's also linked to the kingdom of heaven gospel. That's why you see it in the, early, in the book of Acts. Okay? Now, Paul is the exception because Paul, I believe, had to get saved off the kingdom of heaven gospel first so he could be an apostle... All apostles are, are saved off the kingdom of heaven gospel. And then God reveals to him the gospel that's for today. So Paul had to do some healing too and had to show some signs proving that he is an apostle. And you see that. I mean, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But then, like I said, it starts out with water baptism and you wash your sins away and you're of whoever's baptizing you. Then it went to repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that? That's the blood of Jesus Christ washing your sins away. Being baptized by Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. So you can bring in the spiritual kingdom. So we have that spiritual connection, that spiritual circumcision made without hands. 
trying to do scissors. Spiritual circumcision made without hands, where our body and soul aren't connected anymore. If my soul is connected to Jesus Christ, He's my body. My eternity is judged off of Him. Not this wicked body of flesh, but Him. There's a difference. And people keep complaining. And want, oh, we don't. Because you don't want to rightly divide the word of truth, and you don't want the truth. You just want to be part of whatever club you're a part of, whatever Babel building or false religion, organized religion. You know, you want, they say we have to be water baptized, so I'm going to get water baptized. Why don't you try studying the Bible? Why don't you actually try seeking the truth like we're doing here? Now, Paul, at the end of Acts 20 20, some people say, well, who is Paul to do? Who is Paul to come in and change the gospel? Who is he to come in and do away with water baptism? We love our water baptism. We love doing physical things that have nothing to actually do with the changed life, the real outward showing. We like to fake outward showings. And water baptism is one of the fake things to do to say, hey, look, I have a changed life. That don't mean nothing. Water baptism doesn't mean nothing today. Put on a nice suit and tie with me. I put on a nice suit and tie, or uh, if you're a sister in Christ, a modest dress, and, and I have long hair, and I go to these Babel buildings twice a week, and I got water baptized. This proves I'm saved. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. But you guys get upset. Some people get upset. Who is Paul to come in here and change everything? You want to know who Paul is? Because I get yelled at a lot. You're a Paul Linian. You're a Paul Linian. No, I'm obeying God when I obey Paul. We're going to get into that. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. You're going to, we're going to go through all this. You're going to catch on. I'm just going to keep reading nonstop for the next few minutes. And let's see if you can catch on the point that Paul makes it, that I'm trying to make and that Paul makes. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separate, separated unto the gospel of God. Separated. He's not preaching the gospel that the other apostles were preaching. He's preaching the gospel that's for today. But it says that he's called to be an apostle. 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Slosinus, our brother. 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. By the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in Achaia. Galatians 1.1, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him up from the dead. Ephesians 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Colossians 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And Timotheus, our brother. 1 Timothy 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apposel of Jesus Christ. Is it, is it setting in yet? Is it setting? Who is Paul to change the gospel? An apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Titus 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. Who is Paul to come in here and change the gospel? Who is Paul to come in here and do away with water baptism? And now you've got to get baptized by Jesus Christ, by the Holy Ghost. He's the apostle to the Gentiles by Jesus Christ. On the road to Damascus, people, I get frustrated because I get, he's got, Paul says, be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. You want to be following Christ? You follow Paul. People say, well, that's, that's hyper -dispendent. No, it isn't. It's hyper, they come up with all these names. Hyper, you're a Paulinian. It's hyper, no, Paul said, be followers of me as I am of Christ. You want to be following Christ today? You follow Paul. He's the apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, appointed by Jesus Christ. That's what Paul was saying. Be followers of me as I am of Christ. If you're following Paul, you're following Christ. He's the apostle to the Gentiles, appointed by Christ. 
If you try to skip Paul, ignore Paul, and try to go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you try to go to the Old Testament, you try to jump over to the time of Jacob's trouble or the day of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven, and you try to mess up that, you're going to be messed up. You're not following Christ anymore. You're now letting man come in and mess you up. Okay. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. He taught us all. He even said, we, we've, I think we haven't read that yet, but we're going to read it where he says he, he taught us everything we need to know. He kept nothing back from us. Today, in the time of the Gentiles, he's taught the body of Christ everything that we're supposed to do, everything we're supposed to know that's important for today. He kept nothing back from us. And you have people that ignore what Paul said and try to grab from the Old Testament, or they try to grab from the time of Jacob's trouble or the kingdom of heaven. The water baptism is Old Testament. It's kingdom of heaven gospel. It's not the gospels for today. The mystery of the gospel revealed to who? Paul. Ephesians 6.19, Ephesians 6.19. And for me the utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly. He's going to be going against the old, you know, saying, hey, there's a change. We're not under that Old Testament gospel anymore. We're under a new, a New Testament gospel. That might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am ambassadors and bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now, if Paul was preaching the exact same gospel that Peter and them at the early book of Acts Peter and John and them were preaching, and he's preaching the same gospel, because they were preaching the same gospel that Jesus preached, and he's preaching the same gospel that, that uh, John the Baptist preached. It's not a mystery. It's the same gospel that's always been preached. The reason the Bible says it's a mystery, because it's new. It's the gospel for the time of the Gentiles. It wasn't preached before. But you have all these people that run back and try to grab the old gospel or parts of the old gospel and still try to imply it to today, and it doesn't belong today. Specifically with our subject today, water baptism. It doesn't belong today in any way, shape, or form. We're not under the kingdom of heaven gospel. We're under the gospel that was revealed to Paul. It said it was a mystery. Once again, if he's preaching the same water baptism... And any, even afterwards, as an outward showing, it's not a new gospel. Why is it a mystery? Why is it a mystery? It's, it, everyone's preaching it. It's a mystery because when God said, okay, I believe, some people, you don't have to believe exactly the same time when, but sometime in the book of Acts, I believe it was Stephen, uh, shortly after Stephen, they still tried to preach a little bit of uh, the gospel of kingdom of heaven. Like I said, the more you study Acts, Paul had to get saved off the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And then God revealed him the gospel that's for the time of the Gentiles. The transition book, we call it a transition book in Acts because they were still going to the Jewish people trying to say, hey, if you repent and be water baptized for the remission of sins and believe that Jesus, whom you crucified, who rose from the dead, is your king, the Christ, the Messiah, the Christ, the king, he'll come back. That's why in the book of Acts, they're selling off their property. Everyone's selling everything and sharing among everybody because they're preparing for their king to come back and rule and reign. But at some point, the, the religious crowd, I think 33rd book did a great study on it, where he talks about, you know, you have the apostles, the disciples, you had the common people, and then you had the religious crowd, and all three had to accept them. And when it got to that religious crowd, that's who Stephen was preaching to, and they took him out and stoned him to death. And God says, fine, pause button, we're hitting that pause button on the kingdom of heaven gospel, and now I'm going to get Paul, and I'm going to tell Paul, you got saved off the kingdom of heaven gospel, but here's the new gospel, the kingdom of heaven's getting put off. Now, here's the gospel that's for today, for the time of the Gentiles. And Paul even said himself that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the time of the Gentiles become in. Oh, I'm sorry, the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Jesus called this and said it's the times, plural, of the Gentiles. Why? Because we don't know how long this is going to be. That's why there's an S there in times. We don't know. It's been 2,000 years. We, like to, we want to believe, and I want to believe we're going to get caught up any day now, and I do believe that. But what if we're still here for another hundred years or two? We don't know when we get to go home. We've always got to be 
sober. We've got to be vigilant. we always got to be looking for that blessed hope with the life that we're living. Whole nother study. But the gospel from Paul, like I said, there was a transition, and it got over to where the gospel is for today at the end of Acts. So Paul preaches a whole gospel for today, a whole new gospel that's revealed to him by Jesus Christ. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. That's why we go off of Paul. It's not because I want to go after Paul or I have favoritism, like respect of persons. Paul's just the best for me. No. It's because the Bible says, God appointed him. I am commanded to follow him. Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. Acts 20, 17. And from Miletus to he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come, in, come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. And let's see, 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Back in Paul's day, when you look, read through all the Pauline epistles, there's always Jews present. And Jews are coming in and messing things up. They're trying to get you back under the Old Testament. What's water baptism? Trying to get you back under the Old Testament. They're always coming in and they're messing up what Paul's teaching. They're trying to get you back under uh, circumcision and the laws of Moses. Today, I always say this, today the Jews uh, are God's chosen people, but Satan likes to counterfeit everything that God does. So Satan decides, I'm going to have my own people. Guess who Satan's own people are? The Catholic Church and all her daughters. And today, who's coming in and messing up the body of Christ? The Catholic Church and all her daughters, all the different denominations. I call them closet Catholics that line up with more with Rome than they do this book. Paul was having problems with the Jews coming in and messing things up. Verse 20, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. He told us everything we need to know. You... Uh, profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. And then he gets into verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I butt heads with a lot of the Bible building preachers when it comes to this subject. There's a whole other subject. We did a study on it, on how to truly give, what tithing is, how you truly give for today. Paul defines how we're supposed to give today. And you know what? They don't like it. So what do they do? They have to, Every time they try to push that everyone's supposed to donate, Paul says, oh no, only those in abundance. But they try to say, everyone's supposed to donate. Everyone's, and what's the, they say you have to give a 10% tithe. Everyone has to give a 10% tithe. And I say here, and I go chapter and verse where Paul says everyone's supposed to give, and Paul says we're supposed to give a 10% tithe. And you know what they yell at me about? Oh, you're a Paul, you're hyper disciplined, you're a Paul, they use all kinds of names instead of simply answering the question. When we did the study on the Pauline epistles, and Paul says, hey, this is how you're supposed to tithe, a lot of people were shocked. They're like, I've never been taught this because the Babel building people aren't doing things God's way. They want their water baptism. They want their 10% tithe. They want to build a building, call it a church, invite both saved and lost to it. And when I say chapter and verse where Paul is telling us how to do this, it's not there. Oh, but you're a Pauline. He kept nothing back from us. Nothing. He told us everything we need to know for the time of the Gentiles to live for Jesus Christ today, what we're supposed to be looking for, what we're supposed to be believing, how we're supposed to live, he's kept nothing back from us. And for before anybody says, I'm a hyper-dispensationalist, I was talking to a brother in Christ, I said, I'm waiting to get called that, but if you've watched my studies, we go all throughout the Bible doing Bible studies. You can learn instruction and righteousness throughout the whole Bible, but when it comes to doctrine, it better be in the Pauline epistles. What's the doctrine? What we're going over here? What true plan of salvation is? Eternal, we call it eternal security, but it's being sealed into the day of redemption. That once God saves you, you're saved until he breaks that seal. Who breaks the first seal in, Re in, uh, in Revelation? <laughs> they get all upset because nobody's able to open the book. Well, who breaks that first seal? Jesus Christ does. 
That doctrine that we are sealed into the day of redemption was taught to us by Paul. The gospel is taught to us by Paul, but people like to ignore Paul to try to grab other gospels, or they just completely mess up Paul's gospel by adding whatever they want, like faith alone, free grace. And all I said was chapter and verse. I believe God's grace is a gift, and that gift is free. I can say that because the Bible says it. Paul says that gift is a free gift. But you have people come along, I want to add to the Word of God and subtract from the Word of God as I see fit. And I go chapter and verse for the Pauline epistles, and they can't show it to me. The gospel, uh, we call it eternal security, but uh, sealed into the day of redemption. The Godhead is revealed to us. Now, the Godhead is the same from the beginning to the end, but it's revealed to us by Paul. So we can know more about God, who he is, you know. Uh, what we're supposed to be looking for, that blessed hope. That was revealed to us through Paul, the blessed hope, that we're getting caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. And you know these post mid tribbers They can't stand what Paul said. They said, Paul, you're a liar. Because I challenged them. Where does Paul warn us about not taking the mark and worshiping the beast and teaching us how to endure to the end that we may be saved in the end? You have to endure to the end and then you shall be saved. Where is Paul doing that? He's not. All these people who vehemently defend post-trib and mid-trib, you know where they go? They go to the Old Testament, they go to James, they go to other books outside the Pauline epistle that are written to the Jews in a transition. Some of it's written to the Jews today, and then it's written to the Jews that go into that time of Jacob's trouble. 1 Peter, Jews today. 2 Peter, Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. It's called rightly dividing the word of truth. Paul has kept nothing back from us. And he said, here's the gospel it's for today. Where's water baptism mentioned? It's not. Now, Paul does not preach water baptism. I always have to throw water. He does talk about a baptism, but he doesn't preach water baptism. And we're going to prove it. 1 Corinthians 1.10. If some of you know where I'm going, some of you probably that refuse to submit yourself to the truth are probably rolling your eyes. 1 Corinthians 1.10. Chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We're all supposed to be on the same page. Right? Verse 11. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chol, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Paulus, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. There's the of. What brought this in? Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were ye baptized in the name of Paul? They're starting to follow whoever baptizes them. Physically water baptizes them. Here it is, verse 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say, say that I had baptized in my own name. We're not supposed to be water baptizing because the person who's doing the baptizing, that's who you're of. Either Jesus does the baptizing, or that man at the Babel building, I call them Babel buildings, church buildings, Babel buildings, did the baptizing. You're either of Jesus Christ, or you're of that man. You can't be both. Now, Paul, like I said, he was saved off the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. So he did a little water baptizing, but when the transition happened, he stopped water baptizing, because there's no more water baptism for today. Verse 16, And I baptized also the household of Stephanus, besides I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize. So much for the people who claim that baptism is water baptism is required for salvation. Paul kept nothing back from us. He taught us everything. He was not called to baptize. When the new gospel came out, there is no water baptism. But to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us which are saved is the power of God. Let's see if I went a little too far. <laughs> For us it's the power of God. But verse 17 says, For Christ sent me not to baptize. He's talking about water baptism. 
but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Up here, when you get up for he's talking about when you baptized in my name, he's talking about you need to be baptized by Jesus Christ. And then it gets here, it says, I'm glad I baptize you, for I'm not called to baptize. Water baptism is not for today. How do we know that? At uh, one point, if I didn't make it, in other words, when who, because this whole thing, he's saying, I'm of so-and-so, I'm of this person, and he's talking about, were you baptized in their name? If you're baptized in their name, you're of them. Whoever does water baptism, you're of them. You have John the Baptist. Why? Because he's baptizing people. You're of John. All right. First Corinthians once, uh, but whoever's doing the water baptism, whoever's doing the baptizing, whether it's water, Holy Spirit, or fire, the three baptisms, whoever's doing that, that's who you're of. Water baptism is what man does. Holy Ghost baptism and fire baptism is what Jesus Christ does, what God does through Jesus Christ. Who are you of? Romans 15, 20 says, Yea, so I have strived to preach the gospel. Not where Christ was named. He's talking about the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Lest I should build on, upon another man's foundation. So we don't take the gospel of the kingdom of heaven and try to merge it with the gospel that Paul's preaching today and try to make it one. No. Not where Christ was named. Lest I should build upon another man's foundation. That's not the gospel that we're under, Period. We're under a new gospel that's revealed to Paul. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. What is baptism of the Holy Ghost? Because people say, well, Paul mentions baptism. Come on, Paul mentions baptism. And he does. He does. But does he ever equate baptism today with water? Try to hit him up with that one. Does he ever equate baptism today with water? Getting dipped down under water and coming up out of water. No. Romans 6 1. What shall we say then? What is he like in baptism today? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's why people don't like the Holy Spirit baptism because there's a guaranteed changed life after salvation. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And the world as a whole doesn't like that. They don't want the changed life. They want to continue in their sins, they love their sins, and they want to do some kind of a physical act, like an outward showing, to make them feel good. But they don't want that changed life. They don't want that new creature in Christ Jesus. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin, live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into His death? You're going to find out. He, he likens baptism to the death of Jesus Christ, not being dunked under water like John was doing. How many of you guys remember that story in the Old Testament where you had the Gentile king's servant had leprosy, and he had another servant that was a woman, a Jew, you know, a slave. You can have Jews in other countries. And she told them about Israel and that, oh, if he was in Israel, that he could be cleaned of his, of his leprosy and healed of his leprosy. So this king sends to the king of Judah saying, hey, heal this man. Heal my servant. And the king's like, am I God? He rips his clothes. Am I God? He thinks that king's causing trouble. Then the story, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm hoping I'm using the right one. There's Elisha and Elijah. So Elisha, he says, send him to me. And he tells him to go down to Jordan and dunk himself, fully submerge himself, dunk himself underwater in Jordan seven times. And you will be clean. And he first throws a big fit about it because he doesn't like the Jordan River. And then he goes down and actually does it. He dips himself underwater and comes up and he's clean. The reason I'm saying this is it has nothing to do with death, burial, and resurrection. It has to do with bathing. You're washing yourself. You're bathing yourself. But when Paul talks about baptism, he talks about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. You've got to be baptized by Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, through what he did for you, what he did for me. Baptized in Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism and death. The old man is dead and buried. 
That's what happens when you get baptized by the Holy Spirit. The old man is dead and buried, and God gives you a new man. A new life, and that life is in Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know ye have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. The new birth, the new creature in Christ Jesus. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of our Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost, is that we are living the life of Christ. We're a new creature. That old man is dead and buried with Christ. We gave our old man. When I say, you give, did you give your life to Jesus Christ at the cross? That's what I'm talking about. That old man's at the foot of the cross. I'm not the same person I was before I got saved. God has shown me so much. My life has changed. How I look at everything's different. Sanctification. God's gotten a lot of sin out of my life. How I look at this world. Through God's eyes. Verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. And that's why I always keep getting a lot of these false converts, these easy believism, faith alone heretics. They never gave their life to Jesus Christ at the cross. The old man ain't dead and buried. They refused to repent and be baptized by Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus Christ baptizes with the Holy Spirit. That henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is free from sin. Colossians 2.12, he says, buried with him in baptism. Buried. Dirt. Water's not involved. He's not liking it to going into water like getting a bath, being bathed. He's talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. There's no water involved. Ephesians 4.1 Therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body... Remember, we're all supposed to be of the same mind, the same judge, judgment, but you look at today, there just seems to be for so many different denominations. That denomination isn't in the Bible. There aren't supposed to be different denominations, different faiths. There's supposed to be one body, okay? one spirit, and one spirit, even as ye are called, and one hope of your calling, that blessed hope. Verse 5, one Lord, one faith. There's only one gospel that's for today. There's multiple gospels in here, but there's only one gospel that's for today. And it's the gospel that was revealed to Paul. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And after God saves you, you're a new creature. You're a new man. You gave your life to Jesus Christ at the cross. The old man is dead and buried with him. That's when the baptism happens with the Holy Ghost. It's not speaking in tongues. It's not doing cartwheels down the aisle and backflips. You know, it's not demon possession. It's not healing people. It's not casting out devils. Okay, that was all part of the kingdom of heaven gospel. And those are signs for the Jewish people. They're also signs that people like Paul is an apostle. Okay. They're signs for us to let us know that's the two parts that some people get confused on because Paul was doing a little bit of that after, I believe, the transition happened. We got the new gospel. Paul, every once in a while, it still came out where he couldn't heal, then he could. But Paul was an apostle, and it was a sign for him to let us know that he's an apostle appointed by Jesus Christ. But not everybody's still healing. It's gone. Not everyone's casting out devils. It's gone. One faith. And here it is. One baptism. There's only one baptism for today. There's only one baptism that's going to save you. That's going to lead you to heaven. And that's baptism by Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit. The death, burial, and resurrection uh, baptism. The death, burial, and resurrection baptism, if you want to say it like that. One baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. 
that Holy Spirit. When you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you get the Holy Spirit. It comes in. That spiritual circumcision made without hands. That old man, if you want to look at it like this body of flesh, gets that spiritual circumcision. It's no longer connected to the soul. The body and soul are no longer connected. Why? Because that old man, that your own body, was dead and buried with Jesus Christ, spiritually speaking. And that soul is now connected to Jesus Christ. He is our body. But the Holy Spirit comes in. What's the evidence of that? You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. The life you now live, you live in Jesus Christ. That's the outward showing. That's the proof that you got baptized with the Holy Ghost. That's not popular today. Baptizing with the Holy Ghost done by Jesus Christ at the cross is, is the one baptism that's for today and the changed life. That's not popular today. Why? They like to put on a show. They like to be part of a club and stuff like that. They want to do something that's like a one-time thing. Then I can go back to living however I want to live and doing whatever I want to do. That's what's popular. But truly getting saved and born again and having a changed life after salvation, it's not popular. That's the number one gospel that's attacked all over the world by professing Christians. People who profess to be in Christ, but they're in the flesh. They're kindly minded, walking in the flesh. They're, uh, they're of their father, the devil. They're children of the devil. And they claim to be one of us, yet they reject the true plan of salvation. They reject the one true baptism that you need to have in order to go to heaven. Matthew 3.11 said, I, once again, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into his garner, baptism with the Holy Ghost, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire when he baptizes the lost world that reject Jesus Christ, who die in their sins with fire. Same thing with Luke 16. Water baptism and baptism by the Holy Ghost are not the same thing. And you know, like I said, I kind of mentioned a little bit, but they try to deceive people and confuse people by saying, well, the evidence that you were baptized with the Holy Ghost is, and they start making stuff up. you got to speak some gibberish language. No, you don't. Okay? Gifts of the Holy Ghost is not the same thing as being baptized with the Holy Ghost. You have the Holy Ghost in you, God will give you gifts to be able to speak different languages. He'll give you gifts to be able to heal people naturally. I don't know how to heal people naturally, but there's some brethren that God has really blessed them with that gift. They know about herbs, you know, about vitamins and whatnot, and how to take care of people that are sick, that are hurt. Okay. These are gifts, but they're not the evidence. The evidence is the changed life that you live for Jesus Christ. He's the final authority. Are you following Paul? You be followers of me as I am of Christ. Christ appointed Paul. Do you trust Jesus Christ? You know, one of the verses they like to grab is they like to grab that, uh, well, Paul said himself that we're not even supposed to, we're not supposed to ignore even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And my thing is, is he's right. And I ask them, they always go all the way back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but I just say, hey, what about the road to Damascus? When Jesus said, I'm appointing you the to go to the Gentiles. Why don't you guys trust in God when he said that? The ones that attack and say, we don't have to follow the Pauline epistles for doctrine. We don't have to follow the gospel that was revealed to Paul. We don't have to follow this or that that Paul revealed. All those doctrines that we mentioned. We can go elsewhere. Do you not trust Jesus Christ, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ? No, they, they just go back and grab whatever they want. Whatever the, what's ever popular among the people. The people aren't the standard. I'm not the standard. God's word is. And Paul says that our, how we to sin that grace may abound. And he talks about the true baptism. The old man is dead and buried. The new man is raised. And he's talking about the changed life. The new creature in Christ Jesus. Which we're going to get into. So the gospel for today. We've said it plenty of times before. I love preaching the gospel for today. Repentance towards God, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What is repentance? What is true biblical repentance? It's not going from unbelief to belief. It's not saying you have to clean up your life and then get saved. You have to earn salvation by cleaning up your life. By doing good work. No. 
What is true biblical repentance? 2 Corinthians 7, 9. Now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you were that, that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner. Who are we supposed to be sorry towards? That ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow, sorrow towards God, worketh repentance to salvation. Salvation, what are we being saved from? Hell and the lake of fire. What's sending us to hell and the lake of fire? Our sin. What's God saving us from? Sin. Our sin. Ourselves, but our sin. So that sorrow towards God is for our sins. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Okay? That's what you have to be sorry. That's what true uh, repentance is. And we can go back to the Old Testament with, with King David where he says, I'm sorry for my sins. And he talks about uh, God is nigh unto them that have a broken heart and say as such that they have a contrite spirit. Repentance has been there throughout all the Bible. It's always been repent and whatever God tells you. Repent and whatever God tells you. Today it's repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance has always been there. They take repentance out. Why? Because they don't want to be baptized by the Holy Ghost. They don't want the changed life. They don't want to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. In deed, in action. They don't mind saying it in words, but they, don't, they want to be all talk. They don't want to have to be walk. They don't want to have to prove themselves. So it starts with fearing God, which leads to repentance. I just thought I'd throw that in there, fearing God. Because you had sorrow towards God. Why? Because now that you've sinned against Him, He's going to send you to hell. You fear God, and you come to Him broken in repentance. Then, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Believe. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. Notice he says, by which ye are saved, if... You keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Some people have the knowledge of what Jesus Christ went through, but it's not down here. Why? They skip repentance. For I delivered unto you first of all that, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. A lot of people leave out for our sins. You'll hear a lot of preachers that preach the faith. They'll leave out for our sins a lot. They'll say how Christ died when they do it from memory. How Christ died and was buried and rose again the third day. What, what happened for our sins? They'll accidentally leave it out. Or purposely. Now when you read the Bible as it is, you're sitting there with it open and you're reading it like we are, it's hard to make a mistake. But when people talk, they'll leave it out a lot. I've known men of God that I believe are saved. Not just the false converts, the wolves in sheep's clothing. I know men of God that are saved that have made this mistake. How Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture. And that He was buried and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. A lot of times we like to stop there. We're not supposed to stop. Why? I'll tell you. Keep going first. Verse 5. And that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that He was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. One of the requirements to be an apostle is you had to see Jesus Christ physically see Jesus Christ. Paul saw Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. But people are dying that had seen him. But the reason we keep going, verse 7, after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me, Paul saying, me also, as of one born out of due time. Why is it important for us to keep reading? Because the Bible says, before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Paul's saying that when he's preaching this, it's not just him. When it comes to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not just, oh, I saw him, that's one person. He goes through and doesn't just give us two to three witnesses. He gives us tons, over 500. Before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So you see, the gospel is how Christ died for our sins. You mean he died in your place and there's not supposed, you're supposed to be happy about it and glee and celebrating it? Are you supposed to have sorrow in your heart going, He died for me? I'm supposed to be there. That I'm supposed to pay for that. You ever have stories where somebody that you love and care about jumped in front of you and took the bullet that was supposed to hit you and it kills them? 
And you're sitting there and you're supposed to be like, yay, at least it didn't hit me, yay, and you're just celebrating it. No, you're like, you have sorrow. Let's say it's a mother protecting her child. And that child grows up, the mother's not there anymore. It has sorrow. She took the bullet that I was supposed to take. A father protecting his son. A friend. There's no greater love than this than a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. I gave my life to Jesus Christ at the cross. But he gave his life for me first. And if he's my friend, I look at that and go, I should have done that. I should have gone through that. I deserve that. He didn't do anything wrong. He's innocent. I'm guilty. He's innocent. But you have all these faith alone, free grace, garbage people that basically just dance up. There's no sorrow. No repentance. They're just trying to use it as a scapegoat. Like I said, they're trying to use the cross as a credit card. They have the knowledge and they're using it as a credit card to sin and live however they went, want. And they think they can steal salvation and that they're going to go to heaven when they die. They're in for a rude awakening. If you don't repent, which happens in the heart, and have that sorrow, and you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, how he died for our sins, there's your repentance, for our sins, and was buried and rose again the third day, proving that he is God, and that he overcame the grave, he overcame death, uh, Death and hell. He overcame the law of sin and death. Remember Acts 20, 21. Testify both to the Jews and also the Greeks. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess. Romans, we're supposed to confess both in prayer. Romans 10, 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. He just preached it there in 1 Corinthians. How Christ died for our sins. People will say we don't have to confess. We have to confess how sinful and wicked we were and that we were the ones that deserved to go on the cross. I deserve to go there. I'm the dirty, rotten, filthy one. Lord, I'm grateful for what you did for me. And that the blood that was shed on the cross is God's blood and it can wash my sins away. I believe in your son and his sacrifice. That's the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, how he died for our sins. I keep throwing this in because there's people who are so desperate they don't want to repent. They don't want to repent. They don't want to have that baptism by the Holy Ghost. They don't want that changed life. They don't want to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. They want to have the head knowledge and continue living however they want to live. Them being the final authority, not Jesus Christ. They're of themselves. They're not of Jesus Christ. They're not in Jesus Christ. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That confession comes before salvation, and it's done in the form of prayer. Talking to God. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So you repent godly sorrow in your heart for sinning against him, and it's your sin that, that I should have been on that cross. I should be paying that price. And you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You confess both in prayer, and, la and last, you ask God to save you. Can you believe there's people actually taking that out? I don't have to ask God to save me. I can just steal it. Remember Jesus talked about a thief who tries to come up some other way? He doesn't go through the front door. He tries to climb up some other way. I've asked people this time and time, especially these, the people they take asking, like prayer. They say, prayer is a work. And I, I tell them, I said, if you take something without asking, what is that called? And they'll go, Ur. well, let me say it for you because you're too prideful and stubborn to say it yourself. It's called stealing. And Jesus warns about that. Now, he's talking about the kingdom of the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, but there's people who don't want to follow God's way of doing things. They'll do everything they can to rebel. If you've ever seen those people, you give them steps. I need you to do this, 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 and this. And they will still try to mess it up and do things their own way, no matter how many times. This is important. You have to follow this step. You have to follow this step. You have to follow this step. And they still try to do their own, their own thing and do it their way. 
They can't follow steps. They can't follow a command that's given to them. They just can't handle it. I do what I don't want to do. Nobody tells me what to do. I do it the way I want to do it. I'm going to do things my way. If you don't ask for salvation, you've never asked God to save you, you're not saved. You cannot steal salvation. Romans 10.12 says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich upon all that call upon Him. Call means ask. And it's been proven when you do what we did a word study in the word call. It means ask. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. They asked Him, hey, we need help here. We need saving here. We need this over here. They started asking God for things. All is rich upon all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The reason I say that is they'll try to tell you, well, no, call just means belief. So repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. And call just means belief. So you're saying, believe, believe, believe. That's why we say faith alone. Just believe. They mess up the gospel, the true plan of salvation. Repentance isn't going from unbelief. Call is not believe. Call means ask. You've got to ask God to save you. You've got to ask Him for that gift, that saving grace, that free gift. I've had someone yell at me before saying, well, if you ask for it, it's not a gift. And I was like, that's mental illness. They're so stubborn in their own pride. I have people downtown begging for money. They're asking for money. And I give them some money, or I buy them some gas, or I take them in and give them some clothes. I always try to give them a gospel tract. Throw that in this study. I always try to do a gospel tract. Make sure you're gospel tracting. But they didn't earn it because they asked me for it. That doesn't mean you earned it. That's a lie. And they know it. And in the pride of their heart, they're trying to make up any and every excuse to try to get out of repenting and believing. And they're trying to get out of asking God for salvation. Now what happens after God saves you? Holy Spirit baptized. You get the changed life. That's why Paul likens the baptism to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That old man is dead and buried with Christ. Now you're a new man. Romans 8 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. After you get water baptized, not water baptized, water baptism was in the Old Testament. After you get Spirit, Holy Spirit baptized. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the capital S spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Remember we read up there where it says, The God that is in you, that's above all and in all and in you all. I'm kind of paraphrasing, but talking about the Holy Spirit. We get the Holy Spirit. If so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. That's evidence that you got baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that evidence is the changed life. Not speaking gibberish. I'll say it again. Not speaking gibberish. Some unknown language. It's not, like I said, doing cartwells down, down the aisle and jumping up and being so fleshly. You know, it's not healing. It's not casting out devils. It's the changed life. It's the day-to-day -day life that you live now for Jesus Christ. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. The old man is dead and buried. That Holy Spirit baptism. The new man is raised. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. You'll have a new life. 2 Corinthians, here's the big one we like to quote. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You start looking at everything through this. The life that you live. I've said it before, when I first got saved, my, my life was a complete mess. I didn't clean up my life and then get saved with true biblical repentance. I had sorrow in my heart for the way my life was. And I gave it to the Lord. And the Lord said, okay, it's time to get to work. You're saved now. You're one of mine. You belong to me. It's time to get to work. Start looking at your life through this. Make the changes you need to make. You're not starting your day with the Word of God and prayer and ending your day with the Word of God and prayer. You need to start doing that. You got this sin in your life, get it out. <coughs> this worldliness, whatever. There's a changed life. That's the evidence that you were baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
Romans 12.1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Every once in a while, that old man tries to, to rear his ugly head. We have to keep making sure he stays in the grave. If any man come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, crucifying that old man daily, and follow Jesus Christ. He said, follow me. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul talks about warning not re uh, resurrecting the old man. The old man tries to go back to doing things the world's way, conforming to the world, being a friend to the world, loving the world over loving the Lord. The world's way creeps in and usurps God's way. He warned don't, that some of you are trying to resurrect the old man. You're supposed to present your body as a living sacrifice. It's an ongoing struggle every day to keep the flesh down. Paul talks about bringing every thought into subjection to the obedience of Christ. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. It's a struggle. But that struggle that's there is evidence that there's a changed life. When you have someone standing there saying, Oh yeah, I believe, I'm one of you. And they're looking like the world, acting like the world, talking like the world. Their whole life is the world. And they love the world more than they love the Lord and His way and the Word. And... You know, they're conforming to the world. They're doing things the world's way. They, the world and the flesh trump God. That's not someone who's saved and born again. That's someone who's a fake and fraud. Now, can brethren get really messed up? We talk about this backpedaling. When you see two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, you need to have grace and you need to encourage them through the Scriptures, correct them through the Scriptures, and encourage them to keep trying to move forward. But when you see someone says, oh yeah, I'm one of you, and they're going 180 miles in the opposite direction, that's not someone who's saved. You can have someone backpedal. You can have someone fall away. We're talking about the falling away today. Uh, it's uh, 2 uh, Thessalonians. About the falling away that happens, and, and the man of sin gets revealed. So there's a falling away, and he gets revealed, and then we get to go home. The time of the Gentiles is complete. We go home. Right. There is a falling away today, but there's always that movement forward when someone's saved and born again. Even if it's just an inch. I like to take 50 steps forward and one step back. I, I wish I never had to take a step back. But there's times where I fail and I take a step back. It's there. That's where grace comes in. But when you have someone running, hundred, like I said, 100 miles an hour, a million steps back, and no steps forward... That's not someone who's saved, that's someone who's worldly. First, no changed life. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For ye are bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your bodies and in your spirits which are God's. And 1 Corinthians 7.23 says, Ye are bought with the price, be, the servants of, be ye not the servants of men. You're bought with the price, you're not your own. The old man is dead and buried with Christ, and the new man is raised with him. Proof that you were baptized by Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit. Which baptism did you, did you go under? If all you did was get water baptized, you're still lost. If you got water baptized for salvation, you're lost. If you were deceived into thinking that after salvation, that the water baptism is the outward showing, you were lied to, and you were deceived. The changed life is the outward showing that you were baptized by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2 Ephesians 2, 4, But God, who is rich in His mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. We're dead in sins? And there's no sorrow for that. You don't have to be sorry for being dead in sins. Hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Notice that it says, by grace ye are saved. That's all it says. But I'm not going to be like them where they just stop and say, See there? It's God's grace. I'm going to keep reading. Verse 7. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Back there it just said, By grace are you saved. It's God's grace that saves. Then down here it talks about, Well, how do we find that grace? 
through faith. Faith that when God says this is how it's done, this is how it's done. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. This is how it's done. Do you believe that? Do you believe God when he says this is how it's done? Or do you deny it? A lot of the faith alone, uh, you know, free grace, easy believism. I mean, like I said, I keep saying this because it just it sound, makes me sound bad, but the Bible doesn't actually say free grace. It says it's a free gift. That grace that God saves us with, that, that gift that he gives us through his grace is eternal life. Remember? This life, he that hath the Son hath life. It's that eternal life, and that eternal life, that gift, it's a free gift. But nowhere in the Bible does it say free grace. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. When we say, well, we can say free grace, we can add to the Word of God here, it's not a big deal. Next thing you know, they're adding all over the place, and they do. They add all over the place. They'll say faith alone. Chapter and verse where it says faith alone. It's not there. They just have no problem adding and adding and adding, and, and they don't stop. For by grace are you saved through faith. It didn't say grace, uh, free grace, and it didn't say faith alone. It says by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Faith is what we do, brothers and sisters Christ. And for anybody that's watching this, it's a false convert that was lied to and deceived. Faith is what I did. And this says not of yourselves. So it's not faith alone. And we already proved it. Paul said for repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. There's two things. It's not alone. Faith has never been alone. Okay? But it says not of yourselves. When you have these people saying faith alone, they're making it of themselves and it's just head knowledge. They don't have real faith. It's counterfeit. Remember what Paul said? Faith unfeigned, love unfeigned. You can fake love. You can fake faith. Not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of yourselves, it's nothing that you did. My repentance, my belief, my confessing both in prayer, and my asking God to save me did not save me. Who saved me? God looked at my heart. He saw that I followed his steps, and my heart was genuine, and God saved me by his grace. God does the saving. Then you get into verse 9 where it says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's talking about the works of the law. You don't have to be circumcised and keep the laws of Moses. So there's nothing you can do that can save you, and there's nothing that the, the law, the Levitical law, is trying to keep the Levitical laws can do that saves you. It's God's grace that saves. What happens after he says, saves? See, they like to quit, these easy believisms. They love to quit after verse 8 and 9. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, that Holy Spirit baptism, that new creature in Christ Jesus. The old man is dead and buried, the new man is raised with him. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. There's a change in your life. How you live, how you see things. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Remember, all scriptures given by inspiration is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. There's a change. And this is the change. We start looking at life through God, God's word. In fact, I put this in my notes. In fact, pause the video if you have time and take time to read all of Ephesians chapter 2. Oh, it's just faith. It's just faith. It talks about a changed life. Going from being that, it doesn't necessarily use the man, old man, but with this study, think about old man versus the new man. Such were some of you. Sins of the past, they're not supposed to be sins for eternity. They're supposed to be sins of the past. They're not necessarily supposed to be sins of the present, although they can be a little bit backpedaling. Falling, stumbling and falling, but for the most part, they're not supposed to be pre sins of, the, of, of forever. At some point, God gives you victory over that sin if you're truly saved and born again. You might struggle with it. I told people, when I first got saved, it took two to four years to get Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, satanic style music. A lot of that stuff, I fought God on it. I gave it up, got back into it. I tried to make excuses where it's not that big of a deal and what... There's some brethren that they got, it took them several years to get rid of certain things. Some brethren have great testimonies where I had my last beer two days after I got saved. 
And after that, I never had another beer since. I never got drunk ever again. And that's a good testimony. I wish we were all like that. But some of us, we struggle for a few years before God gets us clean and gets it out of our life. But Ephesians chapter 2 teaches that there's a changed life after God saves you by that grace through faith. And they always try to attack it. Why? Because they're not, they don't have that Holy Spirit baptism. They don't have the right baptism. So you have baptism with water that's linked up to the kingdom of heaven gospel, that's linked up to all the casting out devils, healing, mirac I'm talking about miraculous healings, and speaking in tongues and stuff like that. It's based off the kingdom of heaven gospel. Today, the outward showing that you have the Holy Spirit in you is the life that you live for Jesus Christ. Having a love of the truth and God opening this book to you and showing you truth and how you're supposed to live. What about that third baptism real quick? I know it's been a long video, I apologize, but that third baptism real quick, the baptism of fire. It's pretty, it should be obvious, but the reason we have to go through this, brothers is Christ, is because there's people out there, I think it's more like the Angelicans and everything, They'll try to link that he baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire, and they link the two and try to say they're both the same thing, and they're not. You have this burden in the bo bosom. You're on fire with, by the Holy Ghost and all that garbage. They're trying to link the two and make them the same thing, and they're not the same thing. Now, we've already read in Matthew 3, 10. If you want to go back there again, or just, you can listen. It says, and now also the Acts is laid into the root of the tree. Remember that. He's talking about going to hell. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. It's works. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The axe is laid to the root. He's talking about works. Remember, you're cleaning yourself. That's what water baptism is. You're cleaning yourself. You're washing your own sins away. That's what remission is. You're washing your own sins away. Today, I can't wash my sins away. I need Jesus Christ, and I, I, I found Him. I need Jesus Christ to wash my sins away by His blood. Baptism with the Holy Ghost. Verse 12 says, Whose fan is in His hand, and He will... Thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into his garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The baptism of fire is held in the lake of fire, but it's eternity in the lake of fire, where the lost go who die in their sins. They don't have that Holy Spirit baptism, the baptism that's for today. Matthew 13. Matthew 13. People say, well, no, you've heard preachers say, excuse me, it's been a while, forgive me, um, but you have people talk about how Jesus preached on hell more than anyone, but then you look in there and say he doesn't actually mention uh, hell as often as people try to make him out. No, he mentions fire, and fire is talking about hell and the lake of fire, where the lost go for all eternity, eternal damnation. Matthew 13, 24. Matthew 13, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servant of the household came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while thou ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them. There's the fire. Burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. There's going to come a time where Jesus is going to start judging everyone. 
Okay? He'll do so, if there's a first judgment at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, when he first gets back, it's called the judgment of the nations, where he's going to be dividing the wheat and the tares. But also at the end of the world, with a great, uh, great white throne, where he's going to sit down and judge, and death and hell's brought up, everyone gets judged. All the wheat that's left, the wheat that hasn't been judged yet, is going to get judged. But all the tares predominantly are going to get judged. It's talking about fire. How do we know this? Because when you get to 36 to 43, he explains it. So jump down to 36. Then Jesus sent the multitudes away and went to the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the capital S son of man. Doctrine is everything. This is not doctrinally for us. Like I said, it's either talking about the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, or it's talking about the end of the world. Okay. The Son of Man is the one that's sowing the seed, right when he was physically there. He was trying to bring in the kingdom of heaven, but it got paused and put off. So now we look at this and read this and say, okay, since it didn't happen when Jesus first came, it's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. The Son of Man is the sower. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, that physical kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. That's why I always tend to lean that this is talking about when Satan's let loose first season. Remember, there's three parts to the kingdom of heaven, three parts to the day of the Lord. You have the time of Jacob's trouble, transitioning into the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, which transitions into Satan being let loose first season. Those are the three parts to the day of the Lord and the kingdom of heaven. Okay, So Satan's let loose for a season. That's why I lean more towards it's the end. But some people said, well, there's still that judgment of the nations. And there is. I'm not trying to put that past. But this says the end of the world. The enemies that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. When Satan's let loose for a season, he's going to try to gather the, he's going to gather the nations. He's going to start sowing so much tares and he's going to turn them against Jesus Christ, and that's when fire rains down and destroys the earth as to, that we see today, the heaven and the earth that we see today. And God creates a new one, but there's a judgment between the two, where God, Jesus Christ, God, manifest in the flesh, is going to be sitting on the white throne, and he's going to be judging the world as a whole, predominantly lost. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. He's going to send us out. As therefore the... Therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. The Son of Man, capital Son of Man, shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Everla outer darkness, you know, uh, where everlasting fire, where there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Here you see again, bewailing and gnashing of teeth. Right. This is a good one that talks about, but fire, when he's talking about baptism of fire, it's talking about those who go to hell and then to the lake of fire to burn for all eternity, eternal damnation. Matthew 18, 8, Wherefore, if thy hand or foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them in from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than have two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire that baptism with fire now you have some big time servants of satan that'll sit here and, and they'll misuse this verse saying at the end of the time of jacob's trouble you can if you took the mark of the beast and you were in the hand and you're worshiping him and you see jesus come back you can just cut off that hand and who knows maybe god will forgive you and stuff those are servants of satan Doctrine, this is saying in that time of Jacob's trouble, there's nothing that the world has to offer because you have to take the mark and the beast and worship the beast to have the world. There's nothing that the world offers you that's worth you taking that mark and worshiping the beast and going to hell. Everlasting fire. There's nothing. Just like today, we try to use this for instruction righteousness to say, in teachings for brethren today, saying there's nothing today, there's nothing this world has to offer that's worth you of refusing to repent and believe. Following the true steps of salvation, getting truly saved and born again, that Holy Spirit baptism, there's nothing in this world that's worth you not getting saved. 
But, like I said, you should come across all these people with hard hearts. They've hardened their hearts. They're, they're carnally minded, walking after the flesh. And they refuse to do things God's way. They refuse to repent because the things that the world has to offer evidently is more important. It's worth going to hell forever. And then the lake of fire. Everlasting fire. Verse 9 says, And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast in the hell of fire. There's nothing, nothing today that's worth keeping you from truly getting saved and born again. Following the proper steps. Doing things God's way so God can save you. God's willing that none should perish but that all should come to repentance. God is all about people getting saved. He doesn't want to see people perish. He doesn't want people to go to hell for all eternity. He's provided a way to go to escape hell, to go to heaven. That's what this is talking about, and, and instruction and righteousness. But doctrinally, it's mainly for the people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Your eyes, right now we have all kinds of lusts of the flesh that's eyes through computers, internet, television, entertainment, sports. In order to have all that in the time of Jacob's trouble, you've got to take the mark and worship the beast. Is it worth it? Is it worth being baptized with fire? Going to hell and then being tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity? That, that furnace of fire, the everlasting fire we just read here, is it worth it? Well, I like my water baptism. It won't save you. It'll never save you. You need to be baptized by Jesus Christ. Not by some guy down here. By Jesus Christ. Matthew 25, 41 says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He baptized you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Hell. Lake of fire. Mark 9, 43 says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell. Let's see it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell and to the fire that shall never be quenched. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Remember before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Matthew said it. Mark's now saying it. And, it is th and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell and to the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. There's no death. You're burning for all eternity. You don't get burnt up and you become nothing. That's a lie. The lake of hell, and then the, when you get tossed, when death and hell are brought up, and you get tossed in the lake of fire, that everlasting fire, which is the lake of fire, it's forever. And these people that try to tell you, oh, the, the hell is just a grave, or it's just annihilation. You go to Revelation, and remember where it talks about the false prophet and the beast? The man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, and they get thrown in hell, and then Satan gets thrown in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Jesus comes back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble and he takes the false prophet and the beast and he casts them into the lake of fire. Then he takes Jesus, they chain him, and they throw him in the bottomless pit and lock him up for a thousand years. Then they let Satan loose at the end of the thousand years. They let Satan loose for a season. That's where we read about those tares, I believe. He's let loose for a season and he starts sowing tares. And it's the end of the world. And when Satan's finally bound up and says, hey, we're throwing you in, in the lake of fire. We throw him in the lake of fire. We're all celebrating, praising God. He's got the victory. Yet again, we're going to be praising God when we get first caught up, you know. And we're going to be praising God at that point, too. We're going to be praising God when we see Mystery Babylon get destroyed. We're going to be praising God when we see him throw Satan into the lake of fire. And when it says he throws Satan in the lake of fire, it says where the false prophet and the beast are are present tense they're still there burning and it's been over a thousand way over a thousand years because it doesn't tell us how long satan's let loose for a season it doesn't tell us how long that is it could be a couple years 
It could be six months. I mean, it could turn people against God in six months, or it might be a few years. But the point is, it's over a thousand years, and they're still down there burning. It says here, where the worm dieth not. When you go, when you die and you go to hell, and you get tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity, you're still burning, and you're going to be burning for all eternity. The fire never burns out. The worm dieth not. There's no death. You're just going to be suffering for all eternity. The thing is, is you don't have to go there. God provided a way not to go. You can get baptized by the Holy Spirit. Or you can get baptized with fire. You can't have both. I only say that with you can't have both for the, you know, charismatic wing nuts. That um, just, you know, I'm burning in the bosom. No, you can't have both. They're not the same thing. They're two separate baptisms. You can either get truly saved and born again, and the outward showing and the evidence that you have the Holy Ghost is the changed life that you're living for Jesus Christ every day. Or you can have your fake fire, you know, the fake Holy Ghost fire, which you're still going to end up going to hell someday. Hell is real. 2 Corinthians 6.2 For he saith, I have heard thee in the time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Get the right baptism. Baptism by the Holy Ghost. The real baptism by the Holy Ghost. Not the fake charismatic wingnut garbage. But what the Bible teaches, that the evidence of true biblical baptized by the Holy Spirit is the changed life. The new creature in Christ Jesus. Get the right baptism and get saved today if you're not saved today. If you are saved, you got saved this way. I hope this has helped you learn and help giving you strength to stand for what is right through the scriptures. And we've talked about it many times, but I had a PS here in case I forgot. But 2 Corinthians 3, 13, 5 says, examine yourself. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. First you have God in you. Now you have Jesus Christ in you. But you're only supposed to have the Holy Spirit in you. It's the Godhead. Okay? You have the Holy Spirit in you. And the evidence of that is you need to prove it. You have the Holy Spirit in you? Prove it. It's not speaking in tongues. I'll go through it all again. It's not casting out devils. It's not you know, healing. It's not doing cartwheels down the, the, the aisle and backflips and hooting and hollering and going crazy. That's not it. All that fleshliness, that's not it. What is it? It's the changed life. Are you living for Jesus Christ every day? Are you doing your best? When you fail, are you denying yourself, picking up your cross daily, and getting back to your walk with the Lord? Don't let anybody deceive you into thinking that you can do something as simple as going and having water baptism, and that's my outward showing. It's not. Water baptism has nothing to do with salvation today. Water baptism doesn't save you. Water baptism is not the outward showing. That's a lie. You've been lied to. The changed life is the outward showing. When Saul says, prove it, Paul says, prove it, you prove it. The outward showing. The life you're living. Water baptism doesn't prove nothing. Paul would have said like, oh, you got water baptized? So what? That's not proof. Prove to me that you got the Holy Spirit. Prove to me that Jesus is in you. Prove to me that God is in you. Prove to me that you have the Holy Spirit in you. Prove it. How's your life? How's your walk with the Lord? Is there a walk with the Lord? <laughs> you know? If the Spirit of Christ does not be in you, you are none of His, the Bible says. Do you even have a walk with the Lord? Or is your walk lined up with the world? An organized religion? So, I'm going to end this. I was going to sing with him again, but we got, this took up a long time. But uh, Blessed Assurance. If you can, you can... Uh, Sing, pause the video and you can look up Blessed Assurance and you can sing that. Um, it's about say, the, telling the right story. How to get saved today. What Jesus Christ did for us. What you need to do to get saved today. I like that song. I like that old hymn. But I'm getting tired. Forgive me. In my old age, getting tired. Um, that's a good hymn to end this on. Okay, Hymn, Blessed Assurance. But I'm going to end this with us. 
with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Make sure you stand for the true plan of salvation, the real baptism. And if you haven't got saved the right way, get saved the right way. Time is running out. I'll see you guys in the next study.